Mr. Alex Hankey is a theoretical physicist trained at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Cambridge University. He was the postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Mr. Alex is deeply interested in Vedanta, Yoga and Ayurveda. He played a vital role in setting up Maharshi University of Management and later on became a professor at it, where he taught the first undergraduate course in philosophy of science. In, in Christianity, the central phrase of the Lord's Prayer says, Thy will be done. Now, once you've developed this sensitivity of listening on quiet levels, you realize that you're getting instructions constantly from on high. So, if I pray the Lord's Prayer with a yogic intention, it doesn't mean, Thy will be done. Let everyone else do what you want. I'm going to be special. I'll do my own thing. Doesn't mean that. Sorry. I said what I said you may not have heard. I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be Durodana-like. Dura I'm going to do my own thing. Everyone else, like, um, who was it? Rama and Krishna can do God's will. But what we're actually saying when we learn the Lord's Prayer, as I was taught at age four or five, I didn't understand it at all. Thy will be done. I will have that sensitivity to know what you want me to do. And then I will follow. Service of God. So that is the sensitivity from verse, is it nine? And then there's this amazing verse which says, to those who witness, it doesn't say it exactly that way, but that's what it means. I think, to those who witness deep sleep, deep sleep becomes a mass of bliss. Now, all of us know that we go to sleep at night and we have a few dreams, but otherwise we're effectively dead to the world. But when you develop the witness quality through meditation, things begin to happen of several different kinds. You can wake up inside in the middle of the night. You can have awareness and know that your body is asleep. It's an extremely blissful experience. Then it develops a bit further. You can wake up on the inside and you can become aware of the room around you. Now, you know, when you depict Lord Brahma, he's rather like this wonderful picture of the four-headed lion on the Ashoka symbol on your coins. Heads or lions, right? Actually, it's lions or tails. Lions or tails. We say heads or tails because it's the queen's head in England. But in Indian coins, it's mostly lions. It's the Ashoka symbol. The lions face in full four directions. Lord Brahma reputedly could see in every direction. When you wake up in the middle of the night, you're not using your physical eyes, and yet somehow that all around awareness can also be present. Then my ex wife, with whom I'm extremely good friends, I'm glad to say. She's coming to India in December, and we're going to meet in Chennai. Um, my ex-wife, when we were doing long, long meditations in 1976 and 1977, had the occasional experience of waking up and seeing her body asleep on the bed below her. This is an extreme form of witnessing. I mentioned two sportsmen. Christopher Dean and Jane Torville, who won the ice dance competition at the Olympics in 1984, they had exactly that experience. 
They were just witnessing everything. Everything was working through them. I'll tell you another experience of witnessing from a wonderful book which was written by a German diplomat who was posted to Japan, of all places, in 1947 or 48. He was called Eugen Herigl, and he wrote a book called Zen and the Art of Archery. And his Zen master gave him an uh, Zen bow, which sounds as if it was as difficult to pull as Parashuram's bow was difficult to pull. Very, very difficult. And his Zen master eventually showed him the techniques by which he could draw the bow. And a few weeks later, he said to him, now I'm going to show you what archery is really all about. So he took him out and he made Oedgen Harigal set up a target at an immense distance. And he fired an arrow towards it. And Harigal was astonished to see that if he had tried to place that arrow at the centermost point with all the accuracy that he could using the human eye, he couldn't have done any better. Oh, he said, that's, oh, how do you do that? Oh, said the master, you've seen nothing yet. He fires a second arrow and he splits the first down the middle. Now, when we hear what Arjuna had to say about pulling the bow, he had to aim at the eye of the bird. What do you see? I see the eye of the bird. What else do you see? I don't see anything else. He's rather like Lakshman. He's asked, um, uh, well, why don't you go to Lanka and uh, and look for, look for, this is one of my favorite stories, look for Sita. He says, but how will I know her when I see her? But you've been with her constantly. I've only ever seen her feet. This is one of my favorite stories from the Ramayana. I've only ever seen her feet. You don't find stories like that in the Western literature. It's believable under Dharma, but it's not even conceivable in a Western Adharmic society. Witnessing. Think of the way that Arjuna won Draupadi. The competition was to fire at the target revolving on the ceiling, looking at the reflection. Think of the flexibility of mind that's required to do that. Now, I'll give you a, a, uh, an example from a modern sport. There was a famous Brazilian footballer called Pelé, who absolutely astonished the world in 19 whenever it was. He performed a kick over his head. He was facing away from the goal. The ball comes over up here beyond head height. He jumps up. He does a somersault in the air and he kicks it backwards into the goal. This is roughly on a par with Arjuna's astonishing ability with the bow. It's doing it in the wrong direction, backwards, and yet someone with this flexibility knows what they're doing. Someone like Simone Biles, that famous American gymnast has a similar kind of ability for knowing where she is in the air. These things, I tell you, athletes, gymnasts, footballers, cricketers, my hero when he isn't playing England, Virat Kohli, Sachin Tendulkar, they are at that level. What was said about the training for Sachin Tendulkar 
He did not miss a single training program in all the years he played for the Indian team. Conscientious to the limit. I thought that was a wonderful lecture. Anyway, um, so where does this leave us? The next slide will tell us. I'm going to talk to you quickly about Shiksha. Shiksha has huge implications for how our minds work. This is really astonishing. <laughs> Shiksha says that there are four levels of speech. There's Vaikari, which is what I'm speaking now. And as I speak, I want to know what to say next. So I listen to the words that are coming up in my mind. These are mental words. This is Madhyama. So, if the words at the back of my mind, which are put roughly in the Indian system at the level of the Vishuddhi, here, on the throat level, if they are mental words, what is the next level down called Pashanti? Well, I'm going to try and decode this for you. Most of us here have got the intelligence and the training to speak several languages fluently. I speak English and French and a little bit of German and some Italian. I'm not very fluent in those, but I'm pretty fluent quand je parle français. And it comes out spontaneously and automatically because I can translate from the ideas that I have in my heart into the language I want. Dr. Carranza. How many languages do you speak? Five or six? Five. Most of you here will be fluent in at least four languages. How many people here are fluent in six? Seven. You win. Okay? <laughs> Sir, you have six translators in your Broca's area and Wernicke's area which can translate the ideas that you want to say into whichever language you choose. Hindi, English, Marathi, Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, Telugu, or whatever it is. Because you have the translators which make the ideas fluent, in my opinion, this is a very powerful indication that our minds do not primarily encode, they do not primarily encode digital information, words. They encode ideas. Sir, in the blue shirt. Someone was shaking his head like this. I hope he was agreeing with me. <laughs> So, my judgment is that multilingual abilities tell us very clearly that when we are wondering how the mind works, ideas underlie words. They are the primary encoding for the mind. Now, what I'm not going to demonstrate for you with slides, but I have the theory fully worked out is that when you cite your regulatory system at criticality, it cannot encode digital information. The reason, I shall tell you with a few bits of hand-waving from my heart, that if you have an unstable system which is fluctuating, you can't put rigidly fixed information in it. After all, we talk in India, you talk about karma, that creates chisel hard into rock. You take karma which goes in and it's like a line in the sand. You take karma, an action, which is like a line on water. Waves go out. Everything settles down. And then nishkarma kriya. What is that like? It's a line on air. Creates no impression at all. Okay?
so ideas are actually encodable in this kind of system which is at an instability. And the reason is very deep, it's very beautiful. When you have 12,000 or 30,000 genes to control, of which five or 6,000 or more, 10,000, may be active in any one cell in order to produce the encodings in the Vada Pau, the top Pau has activated 12,000 genes. So I have a liver cell. If it was different 12,000 genes, it would be a nerve cell or a kidney cell or something in my um, adrenal medulla. Or one of those very complex cells in the, uh, uh, the, the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, which has four different kinds of cells, some of which are the naughty beta cells, which sometimes fail to produce insulin. Right? All of these cells have astonishing pathways activated by the genes selectively, all regulated from critical instabilities. Those critical instabilities you can't record information on. My mind is functioning at the top point of the Vada Pau. It's functioning from an optimized system which is an instability. It can't encode digital information. Please tell the people at Google. I would like to come and lecture on this in detail to some of your best IT students, sir. Okay? And, sorry, that's a horrible demand to make in public. I do apologize. Um, but the, the whole point in this is that the system is able to encode information. It turns out that instabilities are structured accompanied by what a famous, famous mathematician who I invited to a conference in 1975 called a catastrophe. Catastrophe theory won this gentleman, a Nobel, uh, not a Nobel Prize, a Fields Medal in 1958. And he published a famous book called Instability, structural in. Oh, it's all gone out of my mind. I do apologize. It'll come back to me. Rene Tome, his famous book, is all about structural instability. Why instability? Well, think of the blob of growing cells. Hmm? You have a blob of growing cells, two, four, eight. At that point, it begins to differentiate. And the amniotic sac begins to form. And then you get the blob of cells growing with some kind of, of, of um, cord, umbilical cord, connecting it to the placenta. And then it begins to develop a front and a back, and a right and a left side. And it puts out five different things. Two arms, two legs, and something in between the two arms, which is going to grow into the head. And each of those also differentiates five ways. Five fingers, five toes. You can't see them because I've got my shoes on. Um, and five senses in the head and the um, uh, and some of the organs of action. It's absolutely astonishing that it's not the smallest understanding in conventional biology of how this happens. Not the smallest. If you look at embryogenesis and then you look up morphogenesis, you find that it's unknown. 
It only happens because of the instabilities. And complexity biology tells you the instabilities are absolutely fundamental to the regulatory systems, including in the growing embryo. I could talk for as long again, but I will keep you short. I would like, if you don't mind, just to do my second interlude and read a couple of poems. May I read a couple of poems for you? So, poetry. I'm going to read you a little bit of Mahashi Mahesh Yogi's Love and God. I'm going to read you something from Emily Bronte and hopefully from Thomas Traherne, which is my favorite. Next. This is a prose poem by Mahashi Mahesh Yogi. It's meant to give one an understanding of the nature of God consciousness. God, my love, light of thy grace, the love of thy being fills my heart. Thy grace vibrates around me. My Lord, my love, God, in thee I rest, in thee I dwell, in thee I am. My Lord, thou art one, thou art one without a second. Unity is thy nature, diversity is thy glory. Thou one appearest as many, as one seed appears as the leaves, branches, fruits, and the whole of the multiple tree. And so it continues. It's a beautiful poem I can recommend. Now this is by Emily Bronte, and to be honest, I can't read it at this distance. No coward soul is mine, no trembler in the world's storm-troubled sphere. I see heaven's glories shine, and faith stands equal, guarding me from fear. To waken doubt in one, holding so fast by thine infinity, so surely anchored on thy steadfast rock of immortality, with wide embracing love, thy spirit animates eternal years, pervades and broods above changes, sustains, destroys, dissolves, creates, and rears. Though earth and man were gone, and suns and universes ceased to be, and thou wert left alone, every existence would exist in thee. There is not room for death, nor atom that his might could render void. Thou Thou art being and breath, and what thou art may never be destroyed. I've got one more to read. This is by Thomas Traherne. It's a wonderful poem called My Spirit. Look it up on the internet. It reads absolutely astonishingly. It's the best description of Brahman consciousness in the English language. He's describing the experience of the center in himself, which he knows. A strange extended orb of joy proceeding from within, which did on every side convey itself, and being nigh of kin to God, did every way dilate itself, even in an instant, and like an indivisible center stand at once, surrounding all eternity. I don't have to read much more. An indivisible center stand at once surrounding all eternity. What could be a better description or more original of Antman is Brahm. He didn't say surrounding space-time. He didn't say surrounding the universe. He said, surrounding all eternity, all possible creations of all kinds that could ever be imagined by God the Creator. Isn't it? Oh, wow. Thank you, sir. 
And this last thing I must read to you. Here, this is pure Upanishad. No Rishi could have written this better. O wondrous self, O sphere of light, O sphere of joy most fair. O act, O power infinite, O subtle and unbounded air. Prana. O living orb of sight, thou which within me art, yet me, thou eye and temple of his whole infinity. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Come here, come here, come here, come here. So nice, so wonderful. Please.